John Brown was a white American abolitionist who believed armed insurrection was the only way to overthrow the institution of slavery in the United States. During the 1856 conflict in Kansas, Brown commanded forces at the Battle of Black Jack and the Battle of Osawatomi. Brown's followers killed five slavery supporters at Potawatomi. In 1859, Brown led an unsuccessful raid on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry that ended with the multiracial group's capture. Brown's trial resulted in his conviction and a sentence of death by hanging. Brown's attempt in 1859 to start a liberation movement among enslaved African Americans in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, electrified the nation. He was tried for treason against the Commonwealth of Virginia, the murder of five men and inciting a slave insurrection. He was found guilty on all counts and was hanged. Southerners alleged that his rebellion was the tip of the abolitionist iceberg and represented the wishes of the Republican Party to end slavery. Historians agree that the Harper's Ferry Raid in 1859 escalated tensions that, a year later, led to secession and the American Civil War. Brown first gained attention when he led small groups of volunteers during the Bleeding Kansas Crisis. Unlike most other Northerners, who advocated peaceful resistance to the pro-slavery faction, Brown believed that peaceful resistance was shown to be ineffective and that the only way to defeat the oppressive system of slavery was through violent insurrection. He believed he was the instrument of God's wrath in punishing men for the sin of owning slaves. Dissatisfied with the pacifism encouraged by the organized abolitionist movement, he said, These men are all talk. What we need is action, action, during the Kansas campaign. He and his supporters killed five pro-slavery supporters in what became known as the Potawatomi Massacre in May 1856 in response to the sacking of Lawrence, Kansas by pro-slavery forces. In 1859 he led a raid on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry. During the raid, he seized the armory, seven people were killed, and ten or more were injured. He intended to arm slaves with weapons from the arsenal, but the attack failed. Within 36 hours, Brown's men had fled or been killed or captured by local pro-slavery farmers, militiamen, and U.S. Marines led by Robert E. Lee. Brown's subsequent capture by federal forces seized the nation's attention. As Southerners feared it was just the first of many northern plots to cause a slave rebellion that might endanger their lives. While Republicans dismissed the notion and claimed they would not interfere with slavery in the South, historians agree John Brown played a major role in the start of the Civil War. Historian David Potter has said the emotional effect of Brown's raid was greater than the philosophical effect of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and that his raid revealed a deep division between North and South. Some writers, including Bruce Olds, describe him as a monomaniacal zealot. Others, such as Stephen B. Oates, regard him as one of the most perceptive human beings of his generation. David S. Reynolds hails the man who killed slavery, sparked the Civil War, and ceded civil rights. And Richard Owen Boyer emphasizes that Brown was an American who gave his life that millions of other Americans might be free. The song, John Brown's Body, made him a martyr and was a popular Union marching song during the Civil War. Brown's actions prior to the Civil War as an abolitionist, and the tactics he chose, still make him a controversial figure today. He is sometimes memorialized as a heroic martyr and a visionary and sometimes vilified as a madman and a terrorist. Historians are divided on whether it is accurate to refer to Brown as America's first domestic terrorist. Early years John Brown was born May 9, 1800, in Torrington, Connecticut. He was the fourth of the eight children of Owen Brown and Ruth Mills and grandson of Captain John Brown. Brown could trace his ancestry back to 17th century English Puritans. In 1805, the family moved to Hudson, Ohio, where Owen Brown opened a tannery. Brown's father became a supporter of the Oberlin Institute in its early stage. Although he was ultimately critical of the school's perfectionist leanings, 
especially renowned in the preaching and teaching of Charles Finney and Asher Mayen. Brown withdrew his membership from the Congregational Church in the 1840s and never officially joined another church, but both he and his father Owen were fairly conventional evangelicals for the period with its focus on the pursuit of personal righteousness. Brown's personal religion is fairly well documented in the papers of the Rev. Clarence G., a Brown family expert, now held in the Hudson, Ohio, Library and Historical Society. Brown's father had as an apprentice Jesse R. Grant, father of future General and U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant. At the age of 16, Brown left his family and went to Plainfield, Massachusetts, where he enrolled in a preparatory program. Shortly afterward, he transferred to the Morris Academy in Litchfield, Connecticut. He hoped to become a Congregationalist minister, but money ran out and he suffered from eye inflammations which forced him to give up the academy and return to Ohio. In Hudson, he worked briefly at his father's tannery before opening a successful tannery of his own outside of town with his adopted brother. In 1820, Brown married Dianthe Lusk. Their first child, John Jr., was born 13 months later. In 1825, Brown and his family moved to New Richmond, Pennsylvania, where he bought 200 acres of land. He cleared an eighth of it and built a cabin, a barn, and a tannery. The John Brown Tannery site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. Within a year, the tannery employed 15 men. Brown made money raising cattle and surveying. He helped to establish a post office and a school. During this period, Brown operated an interstate business involving cattle and leather production along with a kinsman, Seth Thompson, from eastern Ohio. In 1831, one of his sons died. Brown fell ill, and his businesses began to suffer, leaving him in terrible debt. In the summer of 1832, shortly after the death of a newborn son, his wife Dianthe died. On June 14, 1833, Brown married 16-year-old Mary Ann Day, originally from Washington County, New York. They eventually had 13 children, in addition to the seven children from his previous marriage. In 1836, Brown moved his family to Franklin Mills, Ohio. There he borrowed money to buy land in the area, building and operating a tannery along the Cuyahoga River in partnership with Zenas Kent. He suffered great financial losses in the economic crisis of 1839, which struck the western states more severely than had the Panic of 1837. Following the heavy borrowing trends of Ohio, many businessmen like Brown trusted too heavily in credit and state bonds and paid dearly for it. In one episode of Property Loss, Brown was even jailed when he attempted to retain ownership of a farm by occupying it against the claims of the new owner. Like other determined men of his time and background, he tried many different business efforts in an attempt to get out of debt. Along with tanning hides and cattle trading, he also undertook horse and sheep breeding, the last of which was to become a notable aspect of his pre-public vocation. In 1837, in response to the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy, Brown publicly vowed, Here, before God, in the presence of these witnesses, from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. Brown was declared bankrupt by a federal court on September 28, 1842. In 1843, four of his children died of dysentery. As Louis Decoro Jr. shows in his biographical sketch, from the mid-1840s Brown had built a reputation as an expert in fine sheep and wool, and entered into a partnership with Carl Simon Perkins of Akron, Ohio, whose flocks and farms were managed by Brown and Sons. Braun eventually moved into a home with his family across the street from the Perkins Stone Mansion located on Perkins Hill. The John Brown House still stands and is owned and operated by the Summit County Historical Society of Akron, Ohio. Transformative years in Springfield, Massachusetts. In 1846, Brown and his business partner Simon Perkins moved to the ideologically progressive city of Springfield.
Springfield, Massachusetts. In Springfield, Brown found a community whose white leadership, from the community's most prominent churches, to its most wealthy businessmen, to its most popular politicians, to its local jurists, and even to the publisher of one of the nation's most influential newspapers, were deeply involved and emotionally invested in the anti-slavery movement. Brown and Perkins' intent was to represent the interests of the Connecticut River Valley's wool growers against the interests of the region's wool manufacturers. Thus Brown and Perkins set up a wool commission operation. While in Springfield, Brown lived in a house at 51 Franklin Street. Several years before Brown's arrival in Springfield, in 1844, the city's African-American abolitionists had founded the Sanford Street Free Church, now known as St. John's Congregational Church, which went on to become one of the United States' most prominent platforms for abolitionist speeches. From 1846 until he left Springfield in 1850, John Brown was a parishioner at the Free Church where he witnessed abolitionist lectures by Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. Indeed, during Brown's time in Springfield, he became deeply involved in transforming the city into a major center of abolitionism, and one of the safest and most significant stops on the Underground Railroad. Brown's Bible is still on display at St. John's Congregational Church in Springfield, which to this day remains one of the Northeast's most prominent black churches. In 1847, after speaking at the Free Church, abolitionist Frederick Douglass spent a night speaking with Brown, after which he wrote, From this night spent with John Brown in Springfield, Massachusetts. 1847 While I continued to write and speak against slavery, I became all the same less hopeful for its peaceful abolition. My utterances became more and more tinged by the color of this man's strong impressions. While in Springfield, as Brown learned more about abolitionism and the Underground Railroad, he also learned more about the region's mercantile elite. Knowledge which while initially a curse, proved ultimately to be a blessing to Brown's later activities in Kansas and at Harper's Ferry. Springfield's mercantile elite reacted with hesitation to change their veto for highly profitable formula of low-quality wool sold en masse for low prices. Initially, Brown naively trusted Springfield's manufacturers but soon came to realize that they were determined to maintain their control of price setting. Also, on the outskirts of Springfield, the Connecticut River Valley's sheep farmers were largely unorganized and hesitant to change their methods of production to meet higher standards. In the Ohio Cultivator, Brown and other wool growers complained that the Connecticut River Valley's farmers' tendencies were lowering all U.S. wool prices abroad. In reaction, Brown made a last-ditch effort to overcome the Pioneer Valley's wool mercantile elite by seeking an alliance with European-based manufacturers. Ultimately, Brown was disappointed to learn that Europe wanted to buy Western Massachusetts's wools en masse at the cheap prices they'd been getting from them. Brown then traveled to England to seek a higher price for Springfield's wool. The trip was a disaster, as the firm incurred a loss of $40,000, of which Cole Perkins bore the larger share. With this misfortune, the Perkins and Brown Wool Commission operation closed in Springfield in late 1849. Subsequent lawsuits tied up the partners for several more years. The Fugitive Slave Act and the League of Galedites before Brown left Springfield, Massachusetts, in 1850. The United States passed the notorious Fugitive Slave Act, a law which mandated that authorities in free states aid in the return of escaped slaves and imposed penalties on those who aided in their escape. In response to the Fugitive Slave Act, John Brown founded a militant group to prevent slaves' capture, the League of Gileadites, in Springfield. In the Bible, Mount Gilead was the place where only the bravest of Israelites would gather together to face an invading enemy. Brown founded the League of Gileadites with these words, Nothing so charms the American people as personal bravery. 
blacks would have ten times the number of white friends than they now have were they but half as much in earnest to secure their dearest rights, as they are to ape the follies and extravagances of their white neighbors, and to indulge in idle show, in ease, and in luxury. Upon leaving Springfield in 1850, Brown instructed the League of Galedites to act quickly quietly, and efficiently, to protect slaves that escaped to Springfield, words that would foreshadow Brown's later actions preceding Harper's Ferry. It is worth noting that from Brown's founding of the League of Galedites onward, not one person was ever taken back into slavery from Springfield. On leaving Springfield in 1850, Brown gave his rocking chair to the mother of his beloved black porter, Thomas, as a gesture of affection. Some popular narrators have exaggerated the unfortunate demise of Brown and Perkins a will commission in Springfield with Brown's later life choices. In actuality, Perkins absorbed much of the financial loss, and the partnership continued for several more years, with Brown nearly breaking even by 1854. Brown's time in Springfield sowed the seeds for the future financial support that he would receive from New England's great merchants introduced him to nationally famous abolitionists like Douglas and Truth, and included the foundation of his first militant anti-slavery group the League of Galedites. During this time, Brown also helped publicize David Walker's speech called Appeal. Brown's personal attitudes evolved in Springfield, as he observed the success of the city's Underground Railroad and made his first venture into militant anti-slavery community organizing. In speeches, he pointed to the martyrs Elijah Lovejoy and Charles Turner Dory as whites, ready to help blacks challenge slave catchers. In Springfield, Brown found a city that shared his own anti-slavery passions, and each seemed to educate the other. Certainly, with both successes and failures, Brown's Springfield years were a transformative period of his life, which catalyzed many of his later actions. Homestead in New York in 1848, Brown heard of Jed Smith's Adirondack land grants to poor black men, and decided to move his family among the new settlers. He bought land near North Elba, New York, for one dollar an acre, and spent two years there. After he was executed, his wife took his body there for burial. Since 1895, the farm has been owned by New York State. The John Brown Farm and Gravesite is now a National Historic Landmark.